talk is by dr ivan skutino he is the dean of uh, research at st john technical and education campus palghar he is the visiting professor of bombay college of pharmacy he secured his bsc tech in pharmaceuticals and fine chemicals from university of mumbai with the first rank he has 34 years of teaching experience and research 30 years he has published several papers 140 international uh, papers and 30 national publications presented uh, papers in various international and national conferences uh, he has guided 20 phds and one is ongoing now and uh, he uh, has uh, guided uh, around 43 uh, projects of masters level and in his credit he has four book chapters and three patents uh, he uh, is a recipient of several awards Uh, a few of them are member of the advisory board of indian journal of pharmaceutical sciences from april 2016 to present uh, he involved in consultancy services with the various industries bs of germany astra seneca india private limited uh, siba specialty chemicals limited um, then uh, springbank pharmaceuticals usa uh, by this i invite professor ivans for the talk over to you sir forward yeah thank you forward yeah uh, thank you madam for that uh, nice introduction uh, i am the last player today you all are all tired we have exceeded the time we have crossed 5 o'clock and you are just waiting for a lovely dinner right So uh Dr. Shushmita has made my life easy by talking about uh, modeling okay uh let me begin by thanking the organizers i want to specially thank Dr. Santosh Nandan he is not here he has gone back uh for his uh, invitation to come here uh and he told me uh he wants me to introduce about drug design to the audience i guess had anybody does drug design so i hope to kindle in you an interest in drug design and drug discovery and how we can use molecular modeling tools in order to do this now there is a lot that we can talk about and dr shushmita could have gone for months talking about modeling and we can all talk about drug design and drug discovery for a long time i promise you that i won't take long i'll be very 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 brief okay uh, so the most important thing in drug design is what is the end result that we want to do and if we have that in mind what is the right tool to be used in order to achieve that end result okay so that is what i want to, i want to address okay dr shishmita has talked a lot about building models what is a molecular model she gave a very nice example of how a sun build a model of of a house and i think i will i will skip through to all of this now you must have looked at this uh, phases in drug discovery it starts very early at using genomics to identify a disease going right down the line to understanding the target that modulates that disease then once you have you know a target is that target validated can i inhibit that target and really bring about a cessation of the disease it's not always possible because there are many bypasses and shunts inside the body Okay so you try sometimes to inhibit a particular enzyme and somewhere in the body there is a shunt and there is a bypass and it will be just hopeless out here so there has to be a target validation which proves 
that if I shut down the function of this enzyme, I have a handle over the modulation of that disease, over, okay, handling that disease out here. So once I do a target identification and a target validation, then I go about identifying small molecules that can bind, that can bind to that target. And that is all lead discovery, finding small molecules. You have to optimize them for binding affinity. So that is optimization. And then you do your, you know, you do your clinical trials, you do your clinical trials in animal models. And after you have this approval, then you do begin to do phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Okay. Okay. And you know, molecular modeling goes through these all of these steps. You can use modeling from each one of these steps in your drug discovery process. Okay, to get a good understanding of what really is happening about. Should I take my molecule forward? Should I abandon it? Uh, you know, in decades back, this answer used to come about only after doing a lot of experimentation. And the sad thing is that, you know, you progress through much of these stages in drug discovery and drug development. And many times during phase one and phase two clinical trials, you know, researchers has to, had to abandon them and give it up because of toxicity that appeared, because of poor pharmacokinetics out there. And you know, at that point of time, you have spent several hundred thousand dollars. And at that point of time, if you have to ax your molecule, it's a heartbreaking and a heart-wrenching situation out here. Can we avoid all of those things? Molecular modeling can help you. I don't say that we can, we can use molecular modeling and we have overcome all of these problems out there. But at least, okay, with some degree of certainty, you can be able to say, let's not progress this molecule because I think there's going to be some problems out here. Molecular modeling tells me that maybe it doesn't have good pharmacokinetics. Maybe its metabolism is too high. It has a very high first pass metabolism out here. Don't progress this molecules, mo molecules out here. Okay, so you can get some ideas. And I'm saying molecular modeling is always foolproof that we can go right through it with a great degree of, of, of success and certainty out here. Okay, please take molecular modeling as a, as a good tool and we have to supplement it with a lot of experimental, experimental work out here. Okay, so with this background, Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about making molecules with a tight binding, that is affinity, okay? You know the target and let's say the target is some biochemical enzyme that I want to inhibit that is related to that disease and I'm going to design a molecule that can bind to that target with a very high affinity. But that doesn't guarantee that this molecule will become a successful drug that will pass phase one, phase two and phase three clinical trials. Because affinity is just one aspect. Affinity is an aspect when I do an enzyme, for example, in a test tube, and I take my molecule and see it binds very tightly. It inhibits my enzyme with a very high affinity. Okay, all of that. But translating that into taking that molecule inside a body is a different ball game. My drug molecule has got to be absorbed. It has got to be distributed. It needs to have a certain pharmacokinetic profile. It needs to be metabolized. I do not want my drug to stay in my body for months together. It needs to be eliminated. And I don't want it to be eliminated so rapidly because then its activity will die down. So there are so, several issues. So modeling affinity is one aspect. I need to model even aspects of metabolism, selectivity. We all complain that our allopathic drugs have a lot of side effects. It is because they lack selectivity. They only don't bind to your target of interest, but they bind to something what we call as off targets. The other targets also they bind. And that's what gives rise to your toxic problems, your side effects out here. So I need, I need to take that into consideration. How do I design molecules with a reasonable metabolic profile? How do I need to design molecules with a degree of selectivity that it will bind only to that enzyme of interest? That's not easy. Okay, selectivity. Finally, I make it into a tablet, I make it into a capsule, I make it into some formulation out there. And to do that, my molecule needs to have certain physical and chemical attributes. And all of these aspects to be put into a molecule is not very easy. Actually, there is a very small chemical sphere here. Okay, you see this uh, chemical, uh, chemical sphere? This is the chemical sphere where my molecule has the right potency, right metabolism, 
the degree of selectivity that it needs to have and it has the right physical chemical attributes in order to become a successful drug that is almost like shooting a bullseye from a mile away and you know drug discovery today is so difficult it's so difficult the probability of success is like i don't know one in you know if you screen several thousand compounds several hundreds of thousands of compounds just one or two turn out to be active out here it's because of this problem there are very few molecules that can fit into that chemical space out here which have the right potency the right metabolism the right selectivity and the right physical chemical properties in order to make it a successful drug out here you know that is what so don't complain when you have to give a lot of money to buy a drug now you know the problem what it costs and all of these things takes us 12 years before i can put my design on the canvas and before it can come into your hands as a drug it takes me 12 to 15 years and as I already told you, the, the degree of success is very, very poor when I start out from, from, from this. And it costs something like about $1 billion to put a drug into, into the market. You know that? So drug discovery is not a simple thing. It's not a simple thing. It's not a simple thing. It is easy to, to send satellites to Mars and to whatever uh, uh, region you want. It's very easy. The failure there is very, it's, uh, it's hardly anything, hardly one or two rockets may fail or one or two satellites may crumble or something like that. Here, out of 10,000, one or two will succeed and make it finally into, into the hands of the, of the doctor out here. Okay, now there is no time to talk about how do I design molecules with the right metabolism profile, with the right selectivity, with the right physical chemical attributes. I'm going to focus on this potency. How do I make molecules that are highly potent, that bind with tight affinity to my, to my target of interest out here. Okay, so there are two paradigms in, in this drug design and drug discovery. I can use what is called as a ligand based approach in order to design molecules that bind with high affinity or I can use something what is called as a structure based drug design. Now what does this mean? I'll clarify as, as we go along. Okay. So here I've broken the paradigm into you know four quadrants. Okay so what's happening here is information about ligands and here is an information about my structure okay so on the y-axis is information what is that target the target is whether i'm going to inhibit an enzyme or a dna or a lipid or a or a receptor or whatever it is what macromolecule that i'm going to inhibit in order to bring a control over my disease and on this side is basically what knowledge i have about the ligands that interact with this target out here Okay, that is on this y-axis. So let's look at let's look at this quadrant. Okay, this quadrant is I have no information about the molecules that interact. In fact, I do not even know the target. I know there is a disease like hypertension. Okay, but I really don't know have any information about what are the enzyme systems that are responsible in in controlling hypertension. Now that's hypothetical. We have a lot of information, but I'm just giving you an example out here. Okay, so I have no information about the target structure which control. Let's say it's a new disease, and I have no information about how the new disease basically, you know, is actually arises out here. What are the targets that are involved that are associated with the disease? And obviously I have no information about the molecules that can interact with these targets. So this is a very difficult position you are in. And drug design and drug discovery in this sphere is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. Right on the opposite side, right on the opposite side is this quadrant where I have a lot of information. I have an information about the targets that are known to reflect on that disease and I have a lot of information about the ligands also that are known to bind to that targets and this is the most enviable position that you can be in drug design and discovery because you have a lot of information you have a wealth of informa information out here so I have a large number of ligands which I know which can interact with this target and modulate the function of this target mostly it is silencing these targets out here and I know the three-dimensional structure of this target of this target out here and the tools that we can use is basically structure based drug design and the very popular one called as, as docking and we can use virtual screening out here and the other two quadrants basically okay when I have my 
target structure, if, if I know my target structure, if I know the three dimensional structure of my target, but I do not know any ligands that modulate this target out here, we can use tools like de novo, drug design, we can use virtual screening also. It's not a bad position to, to be in. Okay, we have tools which can identify small ligands, okay, that can interact and modulate with that target out here. Here is something. I know a set of targets. I know how they work. I know this information that these are the molecules that can cure hypertension or cure diabetes out here. But I have no understanding about, you know, the biochemistry of them. How do they work inside the body? What are the targets to which they interact with in order to bring about a cessation of that disease? I have no information. I just have information about the molecules that they work like this out here. Okay, that's also a fairly easy quadrant to work with. And the tools are basically called as pharmacophore mapping and quantitative structure activity relations about here. So now I said I'm going to make it very, very brief. I'm going to focus on this on this quadrant. Okay. So what is this quadrant? I know the structure of my target. And let's for simplicity's sake say that my target is an enzyme. Okay, it could be a receptor, it could be a DNA. And I also know small molecules that can bind to this target. Or even if I don't know, we can do a lot of, of work on identifying new drugs. How do we do about it? Okay. Okay, the first thing, as I told you, you need the structure of the, of the target out there. Dr. Shusmita has said X-ray and NMR are two tools which we can determine the three-dimensional structure of, of, of our targets. Each one of them has their own drawbacks and has their own strengths. Okay, we'll not go in, uh, in, uh, into, into, that, into that situation, but it is possible. But there are also some nasty molecules, but somehow you cannot make a single crystal and neither you can do an NMR study because you put it in your NMR tube, they agglomerate and your resonances are very, very broad and you cannot do basically assignment of which resonance belongs to which amino acid or which proton inside your, in your molecule out here. So there are a lot of molecules who are somehow determined not to be resolved, not to be solved by X-ray crystallography and not to be solved by NMR. So what do you do? Okay, we heard a talk from Dr. Shishmita that you can actually do modeling. Okay, okay, you can do something which is called as homology, homology modeling, or more correctly known as comparative protein modeling. Comparative protein modeling helps you to, to get a reasonable three-dimensional structure of, of a target out here. Now, how accurate is the structure? To what degree of accuracy you can go? Depends upon the template that you go. For example, I have a structure. Okay, this is my structure. Who's, I know the sequence. I know the sequence. And I want to establish the three-dimensional structure of this sequence out here. And this belongs to some family. If I have information about one member in that family whose three-dimensional structure has been resolved either by X-ray crystallography or by NMR, then I can use that information through homology modeling in order to develop a three-dimensional three structure out here. Okay, there are various steps and I won't go into, into, this, into this various step. That is alignment and then identifying the structurally conserved regions and then doing loop modeling and then the refinement out here. Since time is short, I will, I will skip out. But there is a tool called homology modeling which can help you given the structure of one member in that family, I can build a three-dimensional structure, okay, for, for my unknown uh, for, for my for my target whose structure is not is not been known now how accurate it is going to be there are several things as uh, dr shishmita said okay about modeling the basically parameters that are there to what degree you want to do modeling out here and i would only say this it basically depends upon the resolution of my of my template how good sorry how good is this of the structure of the of the template and Sorry, sorry. Okay, how good is the resolution of the template and how closely related, okay, how closely related, how much is the identity of my template to my identity structure? These two issues will determine the degree of accuracy that I develop the three dimensional structure of my target out here. Okay, so going ahead, say once I have the three dimensional structure of my target out here, then we can use fragment based drug design in order to design 
small ligands that can modulate and interact with this target with this target out here so what is this all about okay so we know you know in medicinal chemistry a large number of small molecules like this for example okay this molecule and actually we have a we have a database of a huge number of small molecules that we know okay we don't need anything else other than these 2d structures of this of the of these molecules the only requirement is that okay these fragments which i'm going to use in order to make my drug rather i should not say make my drug make my ligand should be very small molecular weight and the molecular weight something sorry the molecular weight okay something round about okay less than 50 to 100 is sufficient they are very small small frag very 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 small fragments and from this database of the small fragments i will now use them and append them in a very logical way to make a drug molecule that can interact with my target out here so how do i do that okay so here is it okay so this is a cartoon i have the structure of my protein and there are two binding sites which are contiguous very close to each other and let's say for simplicity i have four of these small fragments out there okay and this could be any one from this set okay now what i'm going to do is i'm going to do basically for each one of these fragments you can calculate the three dimensional slave it is not difficult to build the three dimensional structure of these targets there are a lot of molecular modeling tools which can develop which can build the three dimensional structure of these targets and what i'm going to do basically now is to see how these fit into the active site of this enzyme out here this binding pockets out here so i begin to see that this one has a correct shape in order to fit into this binding pocket got it now shape analysis is one factor in binding yes i need an appropriate shape for a small molecule to fit inside my pocket out here but there is more to it i have to also actually match the electrostatics how many hydrogen bonds does this molecule make what are the hydrophobic interactions that is that it makes okay all those interactions how many ionic interaction that is made i can do all these ass assessments but in order to be very quick what i will do is i will only look at basically shape similarity in order to screen these compounds out here in my second pocket i see that this is another small fragments which can bind inside a second contiguous site out here the others as you can see don't have the appropriate shape to bind into that small into that small pocket out here so what I, what you do now basically now i have these two fragments sitting in two adjacent pockets out here now i use my molecular modeling skills in order to connect these two things which is called as a linker a linker then will then join up there to make a real molecule so i've connected these two sm small fragments which are bound inside those binding sites the continuous bounding site and i join them together by a suitable by a suitable linker okay of course you know this list of fragments is huge sorry 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 it's huge i have several million of such molecules out here i just showed you four of them i can iterate this through a whole database and do this screening for a data for a database which what i'm trying to get at is this is one answer okay i can actually come up with several answers several suggestions now let's say i have 10 of these suggestions now these are all virtual molecules made in the computer okay i don't want to make 10 of them in the laboratory it's too costly i want to make just two or three of them so then i basically begin to which two or three i am going to make these 10 suggestions what you can do is basically you can measure the binding affinity of all of these molecules to the receptor and there are various tools that are available 
okay the quickest method is to use what are called a scoring functions which will then tell you about how these molecules bind dr shushmita gave you some values about the energy of binding you can do it very rapidly using molecular mechanics functions a little more accurate you can use what are called as empirical functions and the little most accurate are the knowledge based functions out here so what is the difference between these different methods of calculating the binding energy the first step the molecular mechanics functions are simply energy based functions which only take into consideration van der waals interactions and electrostatic interaction nothing about the entropy and the solvation the second sort of, of functions which are called as empirical functions extend it further by taking into account some elements of entropy and solvation out here the third type of function which i told you about the knowledge based functions out here they are the most accurate they'll be able to calculate the energy of binding to a fairly high degree of accuracy because they are based on something what is called as the potentials of mean force out here okay so depending upon the function that you use in order to calculate the binding affinity you can prioritize 10 of these molecules and this and take the top 3 the type most binding and then go into the lab make them and actually do now a biochemistry testing to see what i have predicted actually work in that enzyme enzyme out here okay so you begin to see now knowing the structure having some small ligands fitting them together according to their shape i've been able to get some molecules that can interact with the target let me give you one example here okay here is an enzyme matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors this class of enzyme is in, in, involved in a lot of diseases and there is interest in inhibiting this this enzyme out here okay so using that strategy okay scientists discover two small molecules that bind at those two sites okay this is basically a hydroxymic acid derivative and this is a biphenyl moiety okay so they identified so what what was done these two molecules okay correspond to correspond to these two entities out here now what we have to do we have to link them out here and so what the scientists we did now how did they link these two molecules with the simple methylene look at this with the simple methylene they linked this methyl group with this phenolic group out here and made a molecule out here so that is corresponding to which step this step building the building the linker building the linker and this linker was a simple methylene connecting those two pieces together now look at the results now those of you who have some biochemistry background would appreciate this the first molecule has a dissociation constant of 17 millimolar which means that it's a very weak binder a second molecule biphenyl has a kd of about 0.2 millimolar a tenfold more potent out here but when i combine these two fragments you can see the ic50 value the ic50 value drops down to 57 nanomolar you saw this look at the first two values and look at the and look at the third two by combining them together with that little linker i've got a very potent a very potent molecule out here so that is what has been designed by computer now this has got to be validated so you'll have to make this molecule in the laboratory or purchase it if some vendor is able to give it to you and then do a screening do a biological screen do a pharmacological screening and see if it really inhibits at the, at that level out here but you see you can generate a lot of ideas okay you have generated a lot of and this is just one example i told you you can iterate through that database take another set of molecules again do a screen you can come up with a lot of ideas because we have several million small molecules that we can actually use in this ex in this exercise out here okay so let me go a little further oh this is called a, what i told you is was this was basically a method which is called as structure based fragment based drug design out here there is another method called a structure based drug design which works on a very simple principle in fact very related principle but there is a slight element of differentiation in how we do this let's look at structure based drug design okay structure based drug design basically there are two methods called as the inside in and the outside in out out here okay let me illustrate this okay so here is the active site of this enzyme out here okay so that line is basically trying to show what where is the binding site okay now what what the program will do 
will look at the binding side and look what are the amino acids that are there that are lining this binding side and what are the interactions that are there inside this binding site out here. So the program identifies out here that here there is a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, some way, some amino acid is actually protruding its NH, maybe the backbone NH is protruding into the binding site out here. So there is, it has, there is a hydrogen bond donor out here. Here, okay, the program has identified there is a hydrophobic pocket. So possibly somewhere here, there is a cluster of hydrophobic amino acid which provides you a hydrophobic pocket out here. Somewhere here in the enzyme, okay, there is a carbonyl group possibly from the backbone that is protruding into the binding site, which is a hydrogen bond acceptor out here. Now there will be many more of such interaction elements, but for the sake of our simplicity, let us say that these are three interaction elements which we have identified out here. With these three interaction elements now, we can now build a molecule that can actually bind inside the active site. So what the program does now, just like before, the program has a database of a huge number of structures, small and big. So what it will do now, it knows that there is a hydrogen bond donor, so it has to pick up from its database small hydrogen bond acceptor groups out here. And here for example basically is a small group which, has, which it has positioned, look here, next to it in order to make a hydrogen bond interaction, a carbonyl group and there is CH3, CH3, maybe an acetone, it has picked up an acetone fragment, positioned it appropriately in order to make very tight hydrogen bonding. You know hydrogen bonding is geometric, okay, there's a distance between the acceptor and the donor and there is also an angle that has to be placed appropriately in order to have a very tight hydrogen bonding. The program will do that. It will position that small hydrogen bond acceptor appropriately in order to make the tightest interaction. As I told you here, there is a hydrophobic pocket. So this, small, this computer program has picked up the benzene ring and placed it inside that pocket out here. Now it will also orient that in a, in a very particular way such that basically hydrophobic interactions are maximized. Hydrophobic interactions, okay, how, how you compute it, what is the surface area here, what is the surface area, hydrophobic interactions are dependent upon surface area out here. So it will orient it in such a way such that, okay, the maximum surface of benzene will be exposed to the hydrophobic pocket that is out here. You can position it like this way, but then this surface area will be much less than the surface area which, be, which is available out here and therefore this hydrophobic interaction will be much weaker than this out here. So the program is very intelligent. It will rotate the, the, the hydrophobic moiety appropriately in order to make the best hydrophobic interactions. That side, okay, we have identified a hydrogen bond acceptor. So it takes, it takes an ammonium group, which has nice three hydrogen bonds, positions it appropriately, okay, at a correct distance in order to make hydrogen bond interaction. Okay, so now you have these three small fragments sitting inside the binding site, all making appropriate interactions out here. Now what the program will do now, it will now find a linker that can connect all these pieces together in order to make a molecule out here. Now that's not trivial. That's not true. How do I connect this acetone fragment to this benzene ring and to this ammonium group out here in order to make a real life molecule out here? And another thing is, when you look at it, it has already used a linker and done this beautifully, I've done it very beautifully out here. Now that linker must have certain characteristics. When I'm trying to join, join this to this and this to this via this linker, I must not disturb the positions of these molecules out here because then I will lose binding affinity. They have been positioned appropriately in order to make the tightest interactions. Okay, so the tool will do this very intelligently to take care that, to take care that I do not disturb the original positions of these moieties inside the pocket out here. Another thing is, is out there, I have to match the hybridization when I use, when I use a linker. Look at this linker out there. Okay, I need to find out linkers that have the correct hybridization state in order to, to bind to these three things out here. All said and done, there's a lot of chemistry that goes into, into this out there and then it finds Okay, it finds a linker which can connect to this, then it finds a cyclopentadiene ring which can and with a methylene and then connect to the ammonium group out here. Lo and behold, you have made a molecule that binds in the active site of this enzyme out here. It's not beautiful? Yes or no? Hard. 
you know, for us to conceive such a molecule would be very difficult. But this program is so brilliant. It has done that. But now let's look back and look at the, and look at this molecule out here. Now, this is a virtual molecule predicted to bind inside the active site. Finally, a chemist has to go and make this molecule in the laboratory and do a testing, a biological testing for it, whether it really inhibits the enzyme or the or, or the or the ion channel or the receptor, etc. Et now, when you look at that, and if you are a medicinal chem and if you are a synthetic chemist, you know that mo to build that molecule is ah. It's not easy to build that molecule. It's not easy to build. And you look at, actually, there are not much groups, you know, when you can do a synthon approach and break it down and try to get an idea in order to synthesize that molecule. It's, it's a molecule that is difficult to synthesize. And I can tell you, okay, with a little bit of experience that that molecule will never become a drug. If you look at it and you look at its characteristics, impossible. Impossible. It's very hydrophobic, so it's, I'm going to have a big solubility problem. Big solubility problem out here. With a little bit of experience, you can say the computer has done a wonderful work, but the computer is not using its intelligence to address these questions of whether it's going to be soluble. I have to have a solubility before it's going to be absorbed, and that molecule is not going to be solubilized. Its log p will be something like about four or five. Something like oil. That molecule is a, so that now has to be translated into a molecule that has those characteristics. Remember, I told you it needs to have appropriate physical and chemical characteristics out here. And some of these programs are a little bit intelligent that now does a transformation to make it more drug likeness. We have something that is more drug like. A drug like molecule means that it has characteristics that, sh that ensure its success in becoming a drug. And you can see what, what modifications have been made out here. Okay. One of the modifications have been made that one of the methylene groups have been, has been switched to a sulfur. Why? This got nothing to do with the chemical and physical characteristics. It simply gives us a point where we can make a disconnection and do a synthesis very easily. Okay, when I, when I have more hetero atoms in my molecule, the synthesis becomes a little more easily out here. So that replacement of the methylene with the sulfur atom is done with the intention that the synthesis can be done much easily out. Look at what it has done. The cyclopentadiene molecule has been now replaced with a pyrrole, a more meaningful molecule out here. Because that in a sense will give you some extra solubility issues. Out. Now here is a, a nice molecule, a nice molecule out here. And all of this is done with a computer program. Very difficult for us, anybody to, to sit down with the structure of an enzyme and come up with such a suggestion of a small molecule that can actually interact with the receptor and turn out into a possible drug. Very tough, very tough. Here is a beautiful and a wonderful computer program that has given us suggestion. Now, of course, the program will iterate. These are only, this is one example where it has positioned an acetone there, it has then positioned a benzene ring there and an ammonium. There, I, I told you there are millions of small fragments out here. It will iterate and come up with various suggestions out here. And it will come up with several thousands of suggestions out here. That is all good. For me, I want just a handful of molecules in order to be able to make it in the laboratory out here. So I go back through that same exercise of basically what I did. How is the binding affinity of all of these thousand suggestions that the program has given? Let me do a, a binding affinity evaluation. As I can told you, I can do a very elementary binding affinity measurement through molecular mechanics, or I can use basically empirical functions, which will give me more accurate binding energies, or I can use knowledge-based functions in order to get me the best binding affinity. Or you can do free energy perturbation reactions, and you can, and you can uh, use GBSA, okay, MMGBSA. You can use all of those things uh, to, to get more accurate. So you do that, and you come up with a small basket of molecules of five, or four or five, which are, which are predicted to be to tight binders, and go back into the laboratory, seek some assistance with a medicinal chemist or an organic chemist, make those molecules, seek some assistance with a biologist or with a pharmacist, colleges and do a testing out here and see whether all of these things that we predicted in the computer are true. It will turn out to be true. But whether these molecules turn out to be to be very good drugs, that is a different new ball game out here. What, what do I guarantee you? In a test tube test, okay, if you do my, uh, your biology in a test tube, in a petri dish, it will inhibit your enzyme. That is guaranteed. 
but whether this molecule if i take it internally whether it will be able to cure my disease that is a different question out here it may have a very high first pass metabolism which means that the first time i take it out the body just eliminates it metabolizes and eliminates. it may not be distributed sufficiently it may not it may not reach the site which it needs to go for example if this drug is intended to treat a heart uh, some uh, uh, some situation in the heart it may not even distribute into the heart so those are different issues which you have to address by molecular by by, uh, by molecular modeling out here okay so my time is up i've just given you a small glimpse of what molecular modeling can do in all of these quadrants is very exciting the tools that we have you know we can use quantitative structure activity relationships we can use pharmacophore mapping we can use virtual screening we can use docking a lot of tools are available for us in order to in those four quadrants out here and molecular modeling sort of makes your life easy rather than doing very empirically you know randomly screening molecules against your target and you do not know how, how many of them will turn out to be active molecular modeling now gives you a focus on what you need to do in drug design and drug discovery okay so thank you very much and uh, i hope i whetted your appetite into doing something in drug discovery thank you thank you sir now the session is open for discussion aspects might be of use to the uh, so group here one is that the us government has recently banned animal models and only everything is going to happen with cells um, and, and so what are the prospects in taking these studies combining these with uh, combining these with the kind of cells based evaluation and uh, and how fast this will become a reality the second thing is that what is the role of artificial intelligence now that all these can be done to what extent how far are, away are we from getting designs done by computers just by asking well without any human intervention okay so coming down to that ruining animals for our screening we have models here this is the part where we do screening in model we have these physiologically based pharmacokinetic models in order to predict exactly it's of doing an animal model i can actually predict what will be the distribution what will be the metabolism what will be the localization i can do everything out here these are one of the most complicated computational models that are there and you can get an exact information all that it tells to do do you want to have a tablet what do you have a tablet you want to have an immediate release tablet you want to have a sustained you tell the, the program what formulation you have you want an injection it will compute all your pharmacokinetics and tell you exactly how your molecule will behave or not so these are the ultimate state of the art models and molecular modeling so that has got gone away with artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning is making big inroads in in all of the in, in all of these things okay for example in qsar okay when we have basically a relationship to be drawn between molecules and their properties out here a lot of new chemometric methods have come up neural nets have come up in order to draw a relationship between the activity and the physical chemical properties and bring about a mathematical equation ai and ml has come up with, with wonderful methods okay the chemometric methods that are there are all the result of of ml and all so that has taken over and that has actually speeded up the the way in which we can actually get ideas about about wind in the other spheres also in molecular dynamic simulations also a lot of ml and ai is big is big okay we have these problems basically molecules get stuck up in the well and i don't have to go out how i can prevent that basically what happens molecules roll back inside the well go back and again once i have visited a certain conformational or a configurational space how do i need to go forward and visit all of the other things okay so ml and ai say don't go back because the molecule just keeps rolling on the potential energy surface out here so if i have already visited an area in my potential energy surface i ml and ai will artificially lift this and prevent me from going back rather go forward and search for all the other new new configurational spaces so ml and ai is becoming a great one and you know alpha fold is doing wonders today in in stuff in determining the structure out here so we don't use homology modeling and those comparator modeling out there we have access to alpha fold and you can very easily get reasonable structures and alpha fold is basically all about 
artificial intelligence that is making a bet a big difference in, in so now i can actually do away with x-ray crystallography and uh, uh, nmr and all I actually go forward and just predict the structure and take it and take it forward so big strides are being made in uh, using ml and ai and drug discovery No more questions. Uh, sir, how the Hamsh analysis is related to the QSIR? Quantitative structure activity relationships. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what is the Hamsh analysis? Hamsh analysis basically relates activity to physicochemical properties. Mm -hmm. To physicochemical. Mm -hmm. What are these physicochemical properties? Lipophilicity of the molecule. Okay, the electrostatics of the of the molecule mm. and the steric properties and the steric properties of it. So if I have a set of molecules and I can use method of calculating the log P, the lipophilicity, I can calculate basically the electrostatics and I can calculate the size and shape of this of these molecules. Then once I calculate all of them, I can basically use a basically MLR, multiple mm. linear regression, or I can use more complicated like partial least square to draw an equation between the activity of these molecules and the physical chemical and the physical okay. chemical. So I can actually Actually, have a mathematical equation that relates the activity to these physical chemical attributes out here. So the advantage is that now I have a molecule, a new molecule. Okay, what I do is I calculate the physical chemical properties of the molecule, put it on this side of the equation, and the equation will now give me what the activity will will appear out. Any molecule you can think of, think of in your head. All that you have to do is compute the physical chemical property, put it on this right hand side of the equation, you solve that equation and you will get your activity and it will predict and it will predict the activity. So then you can decide if, it's, if the predicted activity comes out to be very poor, I'm not interested in these molecules. Okay. So you come up, you come up with another molecule. Okay, come up with another. If you have the wisdom of how to now design virtual molecule, you take that molecule, put it into the hash analysis, see what the prediction is for the activity, and decide if it's a good molecule. Oh, here is an interesting molecule. Let me go into the lab and, and make it. So hash analysis gives you an equation between the activity and the physical chemical uh, 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 chemical properties out here. I can use this equation to do a lot. I can understand the mechanism of action, and I can actually now design your your molecules with those attributes. So if I know what are the properties out there? I can actually design molecules with those attributes so that the activity now turns out to be into the desired, okay. desired level. Yep. Okay. Thank you, sir. No more. Sir, there are some uh, free softwares like Autodoc and all no, for finding the binding affinities. Is that uh, that binding affinities are reliable how much it is reliable like it is free and can yes. be used for every uh... okay so autodoc will give you some estimate of the of the binding affinity out there what you can use it for example if you're going to use autodoc for virtual screening let's say i have one million molecules and i'm going to virtually screen them about how they bind autodoc will give you the scores for this one million molecule it will rank them Okay, what you can do, you take the top 10 and then do more accurate binding affinity calculations like free energy perturbation or MMGBSA or MMPB, Poisson Boltzmann or generalized bond model. So you can calculate more, acu uh, more accurate free energies okay, for these small set of molecules for these small set of molecules out here. So I would use the docking scores in order to rank them. One, two, three, four, five, six, and I would take the top ones and do more accurate estimations of the of the free energy. You heard of molecular mechanics, Poisson Bowman? Yeah, heard of that. You, heard of. you can use them. They are end state free energy methods. They are reasonable and give you a, a reasonable estimate of the free energy of binding. But they are time consuming. They are time consuming out here. They take into account both entropy and solvation. Okay, they take both into it, and therefore your free energies are fairly accurate. The best method of, of free energy is FEP, free energy perturbation calculator. But they are exhaustive, exhaustive time time coming. So MMGB and will take you a reasonable amount of time, depending if your enzyme is not very is not a very large out here. Okay, it takes you a reasonable amount of time. So you can do it for five or six and get very accurate. Uh, accurate out here. So to conclude what I'll say, use your orthodox scores to rank order all your molecules, take your top set of molecules and then do more accurate free energy calculations, free energy calculations like MMGB or, MM, or MMPBSA or GBSA. Right? 
Okay. Sir, sir uh, I have done some antimicrobial studies and I have found some MIC values. So, the order of that MIC value and this docking score, that can yeah. be comparable. Like, I got an opposite score, that's why I was... Okay. Look at your MIC. Mm. Your MIC is a real life situation out there. You've taken your microorganism, you've put your molecule and you've tested it. You know, so what has happened is, your organism cell here, you put your molecule in the surrounding solution, your molecules have penetrated the cell wall, entered inside the cell, interacted with a particular enzyme, and killed your microorganisms. Look at this whole process, what MIC is actually measuring. Mm. Now, when you use your basically your docking scores or IC50 values, what it is telling you, my molecule is already inside and therefore I'm telling you what is the binding affinity. But MIC is also measuring penetration, right? It's also measuring because the molecule may not, see, sometimes you may not get an MIC because the molecule doesn't penetrate the, the hydrophobic cell wall because its solubility is poor. Okay, it actually when you put it outside, it precipitates out. There is hardly any molecule in solution in order to cross the membrane and enter inside inside the cell. So you cannot use docking scores and measure with MIC because me MIC is measuring something quite different. In a simplistic way, you can use docking scores to correlate with IC50 values. Okay, you can use. Even that, you have to be very careful. But the best if you want to do, you can bring up a relation between the IC50 values of your molecules and your docking scores, and then try to match and get an idea of it. No way you can compare docking scores with IC50 values because you're not going to get a correlation. With. If you get, it's a fortuitous correlation. Because you understand what IC, what, what MIC is measuring. Okay, and what your docking score? Your docking score is, a, my molecule is already inside it, and I'm just measuring the binding affinity. It is not telling you penetration, whether it has the capacity to penetrate and go inside it and distribute it. It's not telling you out there. MIC is actually measuring the full complex phenomenon in its activity out here. Okay? So be careful when using MIC for value to go with your to correlate with your docking scores. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if anyone has questions, you can discuss after the session. Uh, thank you, sir, for the excellent talk and uh, very informative discussions. Please accept our memento.